Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome everyone to the second lecture of week five of Atoms to Materials. Today we're going to talk about a theory called the Hartree-Fock theory uh, that, that has a very, very important place, a very, very important role in uh, the history of uh, electronic structure calculations. Because it was the first theory that allowed uh, quantitative uh, predictions uh, of molecular structures and electronic properties. So let's get to it. A little bit of review. Last lecture, uh, we discussed the curse of dimensionality, the fact that there's, it is impossible to computationally try to solve the Schrodinger equation in 3n dimensional space, uh, n being the number of electrons. And so the approximation we, we made was that the wave function uh, was written as a product of single particle wave functions. So the probabilities are the product of probabilities and we're neglecting correlations. Uh, if we take this simple wave function and plug it into the Schrodinger equation, the Born-Oppenheimer uh, Schrodinger equation, the Schrodinger equation with the Born-Oppenheimer Hamiltonian, I should say, uh, we get the Hartree equations, okay? And uh, we end up with a set of orbitals and uh, that can be obtained via by solving a single particle Schrodinger equation okay that has the kinetic energy of the orbital the interaction of that orbital with other ions and then the interaction between that uh, electron uh, of uh, that we're dealing with with all of the other electrons in the system but in a mean field kind of way where the all the other electrons are averaged out okay so essentially what the my electron sees at position r is the average effect of all the other electrons if they are as if they were uh, everywhere in space according to their probabilities as opposed to uh, seeing them in a time dependent way in a correlated way or maybe they would try to avoid uh, being close to one another, for example. So uh, we understand that that's an approximation, but we were forced to making that approximation to be able to solve this equation. And what we win is a lot, okay? So instead of solving a 3n dimensional, uh, a 3N -dimensional problem, uh, which, uh, as uh, we discussed, would require many times the age of the universe in its fastest supercomputer in the world. Uh, instead of doing that, now I have to solve a three-dimensional problem n times, okay? So that's much better, okay? We're doing n three-dimensional problems as opposed to one three-n-dimensional problem. Uh, however, uh, there are a couple of challenges. Okay, the first one, this is a self-consistent field uh, calculation. The effective Hamiltonian depends on the orbitals that I'm trying to find. And uh, we talked about this in lecture, in the previous lecture. This is solved in an iterative way where we initially guess a set of orbitals. We use those orbitals to uh, build the effective Hamiltonian. Uh, we find a new set of orbitals by solving the single particle Schrodinger equation, and we iterate. Okay, we feed in the solution to the Hamiltonian, we get a new set of uh, orbitals, and so on and so forth, until we find self-consistent self-consistency. Once we find a set of self-consistent orbitals, we can compute the average energy by calculating the expectation value of that wave function that we described and again you have the usual suspects you have the kinetic energy of each orbital the interaction of each orbital with the ions and the electron electron interaction also in a mean field kind of way so let's look at this type this type of interaction it's the this is the interaction of orbital i and orbital j 
So I integrate over all of i and all of j, and what I do is the probability of finding the electron, electron 1, uh, electron i at uh, position r sub i times the probability of finding electron uh, j at position r sub j. I multiply that over the, the uh, separation distance, okay? So, so just the probability of finding one electron times the probability of finding the other times the actual contribution of the potential energy of that specific configuration, okay? So that's Hartree. Uh, there's, there has some uh, disadvantages, okay? W one of them is the lack of correlation, and we understand that, we know that. But there's a much more uh, fundamental uh, limitation of the Hartree theory, which is that it assumes that the electrons are distinguishable, which they are not, okay? So let's talk a little bit about this, about the nature of a multi-electron wave function. So if I take a multi-electron wave function uh, that has R1, R2, R sub i, R sub j, all the way to uh, n electrons, and let's say I pick these two variables, the uh, r sub uh, i and r sub j, and I swap them around, okay? So now r sub j takes the position that r sub i used to be in, and r sub i takes the position of r sub j. So what I do is that, okay? What we know from nature is that there's only two classes of wave functions in the universe. Uh, by doing that, the wave function, first of all, only changes by a constant c, and that constant can take only two values, either one, in the case of bosons, okay, we talked about the fact that phonons are pho and photons were bosons, and c can also be negative one in the case of fermions, okay? So uh, what this means is that the wave functions are anti-symmetric. Uh, swapping two electrons uh, leads to a change of sign in the wave function. And we're going to see what that means in a minute. Uh, so uh, for electrons, which is what we're dealing with, they're fermions. So swapping two variables has to change the wave function. Uh, let's consider uh, the wave function we were trying before, okay? phi 1 of r sub 1, phi 2 of r sub 2. If I swap, if I change uh, the uh, variables, I get phi 1 of r2 times phi 2 of r1, okay? These two functions are different. They don't differ just by a sign, okay? Now, there's a very simple modification I can do to my wave functions. That's the product of um, single particle orbitals that would make it have the right symmetry. And I can, essentially what I do is I anti-symmetrize the wave function. So I'm going to do phi1 of r1 times phi2 of r2 minus phi1 of r2 times phi2 of r1, okay? Now, you can verify by yourself that if you swap R1 and R2 in the wave function, what you get is negative what we have right now, okay? Because the two, uh, the two pieces change sign. There's an interesting aspect of this, uh, and it is that in the first wave function, the in, the, in the wave function at the top, I can distinguish the two electrons. Electron 1 is in orbital 1, and electron 2 is in orbital 2. They might have different energies. I can imagine an experiment in which I can tell which electron is which. Uh, that's not allowed by quantum mechanics. Particles are indistinguishable. You cannot keep track of individual electrons. And uh, so that wave function is just not allowable. It's just does, it doesn't exist in nature. The one at the bottom, though, in, at the bottom, you cannot distinguish electron 1 from electron 2, okay? You cannot tell me that electron 1 is in phi 1 in the, in the second electron. Electron 1 is both in phi 1 and phi 2, I cannot tell, okay? So that's a wave function that has the right quantum properties. 
that expression is valid for uh, obviously two uh, particle system for just two electrons, but it can be generalized into what's called a Slater determinant. Okay, if you remember the definition of a determinant, uh, this thing here is equivalent to a determinant where I have phi1 of R1, the determinant of this matrix, phi2 of R2, and then here I have phi2 of R1, phi1 of R2. Okay, so these two things are equal to one another. Uh, if you remember for a two by two matrix, the determinant is the product of the two components in the diagonal minus the product of the two uh, components of the uh, negative the, uh, diagonal. The, this works in general, okay? These are called Slater determinants. And so if I have, uh, like in this case, n orbitals and n electrons, this determinant will have the right symmetry uh, that's required for, uh, for a wave function. So uh, for what's called Hartree-Fock theory, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to form our wave functions as instead of simple products between single particle wave functions, I'm going to form my multi-electron wave function in terms of Slater determinants, okay, these combinations of products that have the right uh, symmetry properties. And uh, I'm going to use the letter X to denote both spin and position, okay, the full description of the, uh, the state of the, of the electron is its position but also its spin, so I'm going to use X to group the two variables, okay? So I have the Slater, Slater determinant, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to plug this into the Schrodinger equation with the Born-Oppenheimer-Hamiltonian. And what I'm going to end up with is what's known as the Hartree-Fock equation. So let's go through them a little bit. Let's start with the expression for the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. That's the average energy. Um, I'm going to have the first two, the first term is the same as before, okay? It has the kinetic energy of each electron, just as before. The interaction of every electron with all the ions, just as before, that's the same as with the Hartree theory. Then I have a term that's the uh, Coulomb uh, interaction between electrons. Remember here, probability of finding one electron times the probability of finding the other electron over the separation distance between the two. This is called the Hartree potential, the Hartree term. And again, it's the uh, effective interaction in a mean field kind of way between electrons, electron-electron interactions. However, because of the fact that we started with this, uh, this is, by the way, the same expression as with Hartree, where we just had the product. Uh, of single uh, particle orbitals. Because we start with these anti-symmetrized wave functions, what happens is that there's one more term in the energy, okay? And this term is called the exchange uh, interaction, and it's uh, very counterintuitive, okay? Or it's unintuitive. Um, it's called exchange. And uh, let's look at it, okay? There's uh, way, you know, the wave function uh, i, uh, uh, I'm sorry, orbital i, orbital i, but evaluated over r and r prime, okay? And this is orbital j and orbital j, and evaluated also at r and r prime. So uh, the second term is not the expectation value of an energy term, okay, like I can write here. Uh, this term is an expectation value, and it has to do with wave functions squared, 
and uh, I can understand what that means. It's the product uh, of the probabilities. In this case, for the exchange term, there's no probability. And this term originates purely from the anti-symmetric nature of the wave function. And again, it's called ex exchange. In the homework assignment, what you're going to see is learn what that, uh, how this originates, okay? And let me tell you a little bit about what happens. So when I have two electrons in two different orbitals, if they have the same spin, what you're going to see is that in a properly anti-symmetrized wave function, the electrons know of their presence, okay? Remember Hans' rule, this has the same origin. Uh, because they have the same spin, they interact with each other a bit, and they avoid each other. And uh, that leads to this extra effective interaction. It's called exchange interaction or exchange correlation. And it's an effective correlation that the electrons know of their presence and they go out of their ways to avoid being close to one another. Okay? Again, there's no classical counterpart uh, of this term. It's purely quantum mechanics and it's purely from the anti-symmetric nature of the wave function. Uh, did that, what you see at the top is the expectation value for the Hamiltonian and to find the orbitals we solve a set of single particle uh, equations, um, Schrodinger equations with uh, an effective Hamiltonian that's called the Fock operator that you see here. Um, and uh, so, uh, it, as I said at, early on at the beginning, um, Hartree-Fock was the first theory that we had that allowed quantitative predictions for molecular systems in a way that was computationally tractable. And it has been used very successfully, okay? All right, just to sum up, we started with Hartree. Okay, we have the problem of, of the curse of dimensionality. We make the approximation from Hartree that the many-body wave function is a product of single particle wave functions um, that neglects correlations, okay, because probabilities is the product of probabilities. We plug that in, we get the Hartree equation, okay? Big step forward, but the wave functions were unrealistic. There's no wave functions in nature that look like that. So Hartree-Fock, the key difference is that instead of using um, simple products of wave functions, of, of single particle wave functions, they used uh, many um, uh, Slater determinants. Okay, so these Slater determinants are also products. There's no real correlations but they have the right uh, anti-symmetry. So when you plug that in, you get uh, the same terms, kinetic energy, electron-electron interaction, electron-ion interaction, and you get this additional quantum term that's called the exchange energy, uh, which uh, has no counter, uh, classical counterpart, but it's critical for uh, quantitative predictions, okay? So, uh, Again, a, a, a very useful method. Uh, it's st still used today, uh, uh, Hartree-Fock. Um, so really a big, big step forward. Um, there's uh, here's two references uh, where you can read more about Hartree and Hartree-Fock. And what we're going to do in the le uh, third lecture, in the next lecture, is to talk about uh, density functional theory, which is today. Uh, the workforce electronic structure calculations in, in material simulations. Okay, it's by far the most widely used uh, method for electronic structure calculations. So I'll see you then. Thank you very much.